a talk in, in, in that hall. And we were just students, you know, we're not, I was not a physics major, but we all wanted to see this as Chandrasekhar. So, so we all crowded in uh, to the physics department and there just wasn't enough room. It was probably not even this big a hall he was giving a talk in. And we were all waiting outside and um, they, they had brought a, a TV monitor 50 years ago. They were actually transmitting the talk from the hall to the next uh, hall or something. So I watched it outside, what he had to say. And the iconic moment was uh, when uh, Satish Dhawan was the director of the institute. And he was a very imposing man, you know, the white hair and you know, impeccably dressed and all that. So he was walking uh, as Chandra Shekhar from the central hall to the physics department, just the two of them walking. So that that is in my mind about, you know, how magnificent it was here. And that was my first encounter with the transmission. But anyway, there's a different way to everybody's transmission capabilities. And this can be seen anywhere. Okay, thank you all for showing up for the second lecture. I was wondering how many people would show up after the first one. Uh, last time I gave uh, a broad overview of uh, what is deep learning and contrasted different approaches to AI, knowledge based and simple machine learning and deep learning. So that's the general overview I gave. I've given this general overview talks. But today I thought, let me just get into the nitty gritty. And uh, today my lecture is for the students who actually go about. Uh, implementing software and, and uh, so I'm going from a very high level to a very low level and uh, in between is the research topics and specific topics and so on that I hope to do uh, on um, the next two next two lectures. So today is all about nitty gritty. It's for these people, these are my two, two classes. Uh, this was my introduction to machine learning class uh, last fall, that is this last academic year. This was my deep learning class uh, uh, with the same time I taught two courses. Uh, this had about 100 and odd students and this had about 50 and odd. And I'm told my enrollments this fall are double <laughs> these numbers. They're, they're giving me a battalion of TAs to, to handle that. And what strikes me is all of these people want to learn about, this slide I've got on top is on Gibbs sampling. <laughs> I still can't get my hands around that everybody wants to learn about what is variational calculus and what is uh, Gibbs sampling and uh, things, you know, uh, uh, intractable things like, you know, the partition function, stuff like that, you know, it's really amazing that people are trying to do all of this today and they are not, they were all pretty serious. Of course, most of them have implemented things on their own and just want to know a little bit about what I'll cover so that it, it, it'll be in the exams or projects or whatever. But this was, this was the last day of class, I think. So this is the deep learning one on just on the deep learning part. Here I teach uh, mostly stuff on, you know, some simple techniques uh, in a log uh, uh, the, that is uh, uh, logistic regression or linear regression and uh, SVM and simple ideas of machine learning, which we do here in the deep learning, of course, is the kinds of topics I talked about last time. So that's uh, that's what I, I'm going to be covering uh, covering today is uh, is what is it that you need to uh, to implement uh, deep learning? So what I'm going to do is we'll take on a simple task and uh, and then see how we would implement it as a machine learning program using the latest tools of deep learning. How many of you have heard of uh, uh, a children's game called FizzBuzz? Okay, one number three or four. Okay, it's a children's game, FizzBuzz. It is to teach uh, division, all right? So if there's a group of kids around, uh, you would start counting, right? So um, how many of you raise your hand, fist buzz hands? Four, okay. All right, uh, let's uh, four of us play fist buzz, okay? So uh, uh, the way we play it is, uh, you know, you'd say one, two. If the number is divisible by three, you say fizz. If the number is divisible by five, you say buzz. And if the number is divisible by both three and five, you say fizz buzz. And if you hesitate, you're out. All right, one. 
<laughs> let's, let's do it. This is all students. Okay. You have two. Two. Huh? Fizz. Okay. Fizz. You should have said fizz. Yeah. You had a fizz. <laughs> okay. You know the game, right? Fizz and fizz, and fizz buzz. It gets to be funny. We do it fast, you know. Fizzbuzz. Um, why is Fizzbuzz uh, children's game uh, interesting? I don't know. You guys aren't still in the job market, I think. I'm told that uh, it's one of the standard uh, things uh, in a job interview. They ask you to write the program for for doing Fizzbuzz, right? You heard of it, right? It's one of the classic things to write code in whatever language, C++ or uh, Java or uh, something to write code for FizzBuzz. Okay? So it's the simplest of the programs. So you start generating numbers 1 through 100 and, and if, if the remainder, you take a modulo, you take a, a modulo of uh, the number with respect to 3, with respect to 5. Actually the way to do it is uh, you got to do a mod, modulo with respect to 15 first. Otherwise you'll miss that. You know? So first you check whether it's uh, divisible by 15 then you do a fizz buzz, otherwise you do a fizz and otherwise you do a buzz, right? So that's how you'd write the code. Now, that would be the kind of programming, is a conventional programming would be to write code for fizz buzz. Uh, you think about it, oh, okay, fizz buzz comes first and so on, and then you write the code with that kind of logic. And the machine learning program, to, uh, let's say we want a machine learning program to do fizz buzz. So this would be like somebody who just came in a bit late to this lecture and didn't hear my description of FizzBuzz. And here we were playing FizzBuzz, right? One, two, Fizz, so on. So somebody is uh, seeing what we're doing. Uh, they're saying, oh, okay, it looks like they're counting one through 100 and there uh, are some Fizzes, Buzzes, FizzBuzzes coming along here. And that's all they're observing. So they're seeing some kind of input-output behavior here. Right? When the digits come in, you say that. And they're not seeing any of the logic is divisible by 3, divisible by 5, divisible by 15. All it has got are the input-output relationships going on here. And a machine learning program would, uh, like the observer now, would uh, learn that that's what's going on. That's the relationship between the input and the output and reproduce that, that in the future. And the kind of machine learning program we want to write is not one that learns on 1 through 100 because, uh, and then we test it on 1 through 100, can it do? Well, that's cheating for, uh, from machine learning viewpoint. It's called testing on the uh, training set, right? It says exactly, so it can by heart, saying 1, 2, fizz, uh, 4, buzz, like that. So it would, uh, we would want to uh, teach it on uh, data that it has not seen before or do the other way around. So we could train it on, let's go from 101 to uh, 10,000. We give, give it a lot of data. And so we'd, we'd run FizzBuzz through and we'd have uh, all of us playing FizzBuzz and we're all very good at it. And uh, it would learn all of that. And then let's say we test it on 1 through 100, how it does. So this would be the style of programming of machine learning where the work, the early inputs are the input output. And, uh, and it has to learn what is the underlying logic that is the machine learning part of it. So most of these tasks we come across in machine learning are of that nature. We know what we want. This is an example of supervised learning also, because we're saying for input is the output. So we're supervising it saying that's the relationship. So anyway, that's the, that's the task we'll try and do. So the first programming process, I think I gave that, which I might change for this class, the first project I gave was go implement FizzBuzz using TensorFlow, right? I mean, they have to have taken this course first, introduction to machine learning. So if you know something about machine learning, they know about, you know, gradient descent and they know about uh, testing and you know, training and testing sets and basic ideas they already have. But here they have to go and implement it uh, in TensorFlow because the next project is going to involve, uh, you know, more complicated architectures they're needed for, for FISBUS. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to cover is um, a little bit broad picture most of you know about. Uh, you can easily find it out there. 
what are the frameworks for deep learning? So you, you want to be a practitioner of deep learning. So what do, what do I need to know? Deep learning frameworks. And I have chosen among all the possible libraries that you could use for deep learning, this library called TensorFlow. So we're going to learn TensorFlow if you haven't encountered it before. And the example implementation is FizzBuzz. We can do the FizzBuzz in that. Uh, and then the last part here is practical methodology is, uh, this is a complicated enterprise, this, this deep learning thing. And I want to implement code for doing this machine learning task, that machine learning task. And, and you, you encounter all kinds of strange things here. You know, these are all deep learning, deep, deep free forward networks. And you know, how do I, how do I debug this? It's not performing well. Is it is the problem with, with the code or is the data? Where is the problem here? Why is it not performing well? So it's a complicated uh, type of thing. And it's not the kind of logic we can work through in the ordinary programming. You can say this might be the logical bug here. So this requires a whole slew of different kind of thinking. So this deep learning framework requires different type of programming, different kind of approach. So it's kind of turning everything upside down, which kind of makes it int very interesting. All right, so let's begin with uh, writing the code for FizzBuzz. So uh, the program we're going to write is print i equal to 1 through 100, except if divisible by 3, print fizz. If divisible by 5, print buzz. If divisible by both 3 and 5, print FizzBuzz. So uh, FizzBuzz is a uh, program is going to play this game. And now we say, can you write a program to do that? So conventional algorithm, I could write a C++ code here. I think you probably can program in C++ better than I do. This language has been around. C++ has been around. C was around 50 years ago when I was listening to S. Chandrasekhar and Satish Dhawan. It's 1969. That's when C was invented. And then about 10 years later, C++ came around and so on. So it's been still around. It's a C++ code. Python is about uh, maybe 20 years old or something. It's a newer programming language. And uh, in C++, the code would uh, look something like this, for integer i equal to 1 to 100, i++ plus plus here, c out fizz buzz, else uh, c out fizz, uh, c out buzz. So anyway, this is the complete code, C++ code, for doing uh, fizz buzz. You could write the code in Python also here, so the code looks like this, you know, uh, if i uh, is 0, continue, else if divisible by 50. This is the i percentage 15 equal to 0. That's the modulo uh, function of uh, Python uh, that yields uh, the, what is the remainder after division by 15. If i percentage 15 represents that. If that is equal to 0, print fizz buzz. If that modulo i5 is 0, print buzz. Whether it's fizz and so on, so that's the code in Python. So contrasting C++ and Python over here. Uh, let's see, what's the difference between Python and C++? Python is an interpreted language and emphasizes code readability. Fewer lines of code than C++ or Java. And it has got a library called NumPy or NumPy, an extension to Python, library of functions to operate on arrays. Ah. So this deep learning, machine learning is full of vectors scalars and vectors and matrices and tensors. So it's got all of these kinds of things that we need to deal with. And NumPy provides a library of these things. I understand that Python is an interpreted language in the sense that every statement can be executed right away without the whole code to be compiled. And it can also be compiled also. Right? So it's not just an interpreted language. So this new world of uh, learning, deep learning, and all is, is moving away from C++ to Python. And uh, C++ has been the popular language for embedded systems. You know, all kinds of controllers will have AI built into it. And uh, what is the code written in? And still C++, but apparently it's all moving towards Python. And most uh, computer science departments uh, you know, around the world are just moving to Python as the introductory course. I don't know if you're all doing it over here too. Uh, and uh, the floor is there, the stage is there. There are two more halls you can go to. Yeah. And um, so, so this has been uh, so Python is the is the 
I understand uh, those who are graduating now with computer science degrees and they're all comfortable with Python as opposed to, you know, C++ and so on. So anyway, this whole deep learning is built on Python. So your starting point would be, you know, getting started with Python. All right. So do, I, I put up this slide already once last week, and I just have one or two slides from last week coming up again. There are like hundreds of architectures like these, uh, uh, deep learning feed forward networks. If you're going to do a FizzBuzz in, uh, in deep learning, we'd have to choose some architecture to do it. And we could choose a simple feed forward network, inputs, outputs, and hidden units. And uh, since it's such a simple problem, we probably need the simplest of networks with uh, just one, one hidden layer, a simple neural network. Feel free to sit on the stage or there is more space here or there are two more rooms you can go to. All right, so there is a feed, we saw all these things, autoencoder, restricted belief, uh, restricted Boltzmann machine and deep belief networks and so on. We'll see some of these uh, next two lectures. Uh, last lecture we'll talk about GANs and things like that. But anyway, we're going to be sticking to a simple architecture. So we are going to use FizzBuzz using a simple multi-layer per subtron as it's called. And uh, given the supervised output, 1, 2, Fizz, 4, Buzz, 7, 8, Fizz, Buzz, 11, Fizz, 13, 14, Fizz, Buzz, 16, 17, etc. This is the input-output behavior of this program. And this is a simple hidden, one hidden layer uh, network where we have inputs labeled X. In all of this machine learning terminology, X means input, Y means output. <laughs> That's become kind of conventional now. And then you've got these hidden units here. I have got Z here from an old convention. Today they are all labeled as H. H means hidden unit, H1 through H. Yeah? And uh, these black circles are called biases. Uh, these are just the inputs. There's a bias coming into play. And for a linear function, you add a bias uh, to the product of the weights and the inputs, add a bias to it so that you can position your, your hyperplane some way. But that can be gotten rid of by increasing the dimension of the input by one. So anyway, we'll come to that later. So this is a simple multi-layer perceptron, input x, d equal to 10. So what we're going to do for FizzBuzz is uh, we're going to use 10 uh, bits as input. Instead of giving a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we'll say let us encode the input by 10 bits. What? Why do you need to do that? Well, that is actually this thing that goes on in machine learning and deep learning. What you do is the representations are not like, you know, single place. It will be like distributed. So the key to neural networks deep learning is what is called as distributed representations. So the representation of, a, of the partitioning of the feature space is not by a few parameters for every line, like SVM and others. They kind of define things by saying, what are the parameters for this particular separating line here, support vectors, so on. Um, and uh, there is a, these, these methods, uh, the uh, neural networks and, and deep learning use what are called distributed representation. So this input is a distributed representation represented by 10 bit input. With 10 bits, we can, we can encode much more than 1 to 100, right? With, uh, with 10 bits, we can go up to 1024. We can go to 0 to 1023, 20, 20, right? We can, we can encode that here. And we choose, let's say, the number of hidden units equal to 1000, all right? Some, some number, maybe. How do you choose the number of hidden units is, a, is, a, is an interesting question. The more you uh, uh, put in there, you get more degrees of freedom. The danger here is the capacity of the network grows. You know. It means it can memorize everything. So there is a trade-off that you have to do, saying if it's too few, it's compressing, may not have enough degrees of freedom. So some arbitrary number. And the output, we're going to represent it by y, which is... Uh, which is output with the number of possibilities y1 through yk, it says, and in fact, k equal to 4, and uh, we call it as a, uh, and these values are what? The output can be, print out the number that you got, got as input, you can do a fizz, you can do a buzz, or you can do a fizz buzz. So there are four possible outputs. And only one of these bits is going to be on here in the output, and uh, that is, uh, so this kind of a representation is called as a one-hot vector in this uh, information retrieval world. And so, so only one bit is on saying what is on. So it's kind of a redundant representation. For uh, four, four outputs uh, you're using, uh, uh, you could only use two bits, but we use four bits here to represent that. 
All right. So where, where are we now? We're going to do uh, a simple multi-layer perceptron, and we're going to now go and write the code for doing FISBUS. So what uh, tool should we use? Of course, it can be Python. There are so many wonderful libraries available. This is a very outdated slide from 2017, the way things go. And, uh, and so who are the players who are creating all these frameworks for, for people to uh, program? Who are the big companies? Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and uh, Amazon AWS. That is the Amazon Web Services, which is the division of Amazon that does software development and things like that. And they all have put out libraries out there for you to go and use it in, in writing your code. And uh, Google seems to be winning out here. Uh, Google came up with this thing called TensorFlow, Keras. And then Amazon AWS had an MXNet. And Microsoft had this CNTK. And uh, it, it expands to something from the neural network side of things. And apparently, they both are located in Seattle, right? So they both got together and said, okay, okay, let's, let's do it together. So they come up with this thing called Gluon uh, from, from, from the Seattle group. And then uh, Facebook uh, with Jan Lacoon and others, uh, they promote this thing called PyTorch. And uh, they say, oh, PyTorch is the best. Uh, uh, apparently it's more meant for very quickly you can, you can code in PyTorch compared to TensorFlow. And they say, okay, PyTorch is for hobbies and you want to get quickly started on it. Can go there, whereas uh, uh, TensorFlow is for large development work, you're working for a company and things like that. So there are all these choices that are available, these frameworks, which are essentially Python libraries. Okay, so here is a small list. There are like, you know, much larger, as you saw in the picture, publicly available Python libraries. The earliest one was Tiano. This is, uh, this. I think uh, it came out of, uh, you know, Benjio and uh, former uh, Jeff Hinton students in, in Canada. Canada, bad country, right? <laughs> At least in the news today. Uh, anyway, it all came from Canada. And uh, so, uh, Tiano came out of there. But I, from what I've heard, it's terminated in 2018. They said they gave up because it's all these big companies that are dominating with all their libraries. Uh, and uh, NumPy is one of their creations. This is numerical computation for CPUs and GPUs and so on. You know, general pro this is graphics processing units and so on. PyTorch is the one that is, uh, that is from Facebook, GPU-enabled drop-in replacement for NumPy, GPU-enabled. So you can have drivers for, your, for these uh, processors. For rapid prototyping and research for hobbies, so PyTorch might be the, the fast way to get going. TensorFlow, better for large-scale deployments, especially when cross-platform embedded deployment, things like that. Gluon is, there is a new thing from, from Microsoft and AWS. It's a model and training algorithm about closer, high-performance training. Anyway, these are all the things that are out there that they talk about uh, that uh, you could choose whatever you want. Um, okay. So let's say we didn't go with TensorFlow, right? So we install TensorFlow. So if you go to the TensorFlow uh, implementation website, which, uh, which that's what I did, uh, TensorFlow is CPU support only. All you're doing is ordinary CPU. Typically easier to install five to 10 minutes, you can install TensorFlow. If you have a GPU available, TensorFlow with GPU support, significantly faster. And the kind of hardware people all seem to be going, there's only one monopoly here, which is NVIDIA, their, their GPUs. And uh, they have drivers and all software is CUDA, with expansion to one of those uh, things from the neural network domain, API and drivers. And, uh, and then they put on their website saying, hey, you should be using uh, TensorFlow. The following companies use TensorFlow. It's on their website, Airbnb, AMD, NVIDIA, whatever, Google, of course. Google, they started all this, eBay, Qualcomm, and all this. What is missing on this list is Facebook, which is on the PyTorch side of things. And, uh, Microsoft and uh, so on. And my students, my last class you saw, I gave them a project, go implement in TensorFlow, get everything free, go and uh, you know, download it and uh, get some computing time from uh, whichever company is giving it out, Amazon or so on. But they came back and started complaining to me saying, Professor, all these uh, companies, they say they give it to you free for students, they give you only $100 worth and by the time I start, even get started, the $100 is all over. 
And so, you know, we can't really do any of these projects on, on this free time. So they said, we need, a, we need an NVIDIA GPU. They all came to my door and, you know, I, I scrambled and got together whatever little uh, grant money I had left and said, okay, we bought a, uh, this is an NVIDIA GPU uh, that my PhD student Mohammed is, uh, is coding here on. This is uh, three times NVIDIA GTX 1080. It cost about $8,000. That's what it takes. You probably have these things here, right? You have NVIDIA stuff here, okay? <laughs> You're better off than me. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, what is it called tensor flow? So, so we have to ask the question, what is tensor and what is flow? <laughs> Turns out the idea of tensors have been around for at least 100 years. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just a generalization of the idea of scalars, uh, vectors, matrices. What's next, you know? So you have tensors. And why have they been around? Uh, apparently, a lot of this stuff comes from uh, people who do stress and strain uh, about uh, materials and all that, right? Actually, I took a course on that when I was a student here at IASC. We had to do that stuff. Which department does that? Mechanical engineering? Civil engineering, mechanical. Yeah, they all know about stress and strain. It's pretty complicated stuff. So you have uh, three-dimensional things here. And then uh, in the three-dimensional world, you might have stresses and strain to particles in three dimensions. We have three dimensions and, th and stresses and strains in three dimensions. So a coordinate system plus all of this. So it, it kind of multiplies around here. So you need tensors. And if you look at all references for tensors, it goes back all the way to Einstein. So these physics guys, they were doing tensors and stuff like that long, long ago. And we in computer science are coming, coming, you know, encountering it now. So here is a 1D tensor is a vector, a 2D tensor is a square there, it's a, it's a matrix. A 3D tensor uh, is that cube there. A 4D tensor is the arrangement of cubes and 5D tensor is the arrangement of these sets of cubes and a 6D tensor is the arrangement of these. So you can go on like that. So you can have uh, lots of complexity here. And um, why do we need uh, these tensors, uh, all these uh, kinds of things, uh, and what is flow? Well, here is a simple example of a simple linear classifier. It could be uh, a, a logistic regression classifier. And here is an input image which we want to classify as a cat, a dog, or a ship. There is a particular data set that has got things like cats, dogs, and ships, right? Which one is that? Anyway, students also uh, use this all the time. Um, other than MNIST, there's the next data set, right? Hmm? What is it called? CIFAR. CIFAR, yeah, that's what I was looking for. CIFAR. CIFAR data set has that. So here we have this input image is being represented here by a vector. It could be all the pixels in that, uh, in that vector. And we are multi multiplying it by a matrix W. We're going to make sure that the, it comes out as a vector. And then we have a D added to it that gives us the output. And that is the score. Of course, the learning part of it is to figure out this W here and the B here. And the input is this Xi. And here we are assuming that this picture is a black and white picture. Although my figure shows a color picture, it's a black and white picture that is being classified. And of course, in this case, uh, I had this bias B being added on that in this next formulation, that bias B, uh, this whole formulation here is replaced by another one where the bias B is incorporated into the W and the XI. XI this value is one here, and the B goes in over here. So we can get rid of the B. It's a standard way of getting rid of the bias in these kinds of classifiers. So a simple uh, uh, logistic regression classifier would work like that. The only interesting thing is how to figure out W. And so essentially, we are taking these uh, matrices and flowing them down, doing some operations to create other vectors or matrices, so on. And what if this was not, we want to take the whole color image, color information we want to take into account. So in this case, we just don't have a simple 2D array. We now have a 3D tensor because we got to have an R version of RGB. So you now have a three-dimensional uh, matrix. Uh, each plane corresponds to each color. Uh, of course, if you have video, there would be another dimension. So Einstein and others were definitely looking at things like, you know, three-dimensional space and time and things like that, right? So, so they were all interested in these tensors. So what is the flow here is the data flows from one 
point to the next point as we saw in those networks and in these kinds of matrix manipulations. So appropriately they call their uh, software package as TensorFlow. And another concept, all kinds of new things come in into this deep learning thing. Um, the idea of a computational graph is an important idea for deep learning. So a computational graph is a simple idea. Network structure is specified by computational graphs. And here are simple examples of computational graphs. We say here is an A, B, and this is C equal to A plus B. It says A flows in here, B flows in here. This is the computation here. That result goes up here. And D equal to B plus 1, and that goes here. E is equal to C times D. This kind of a graph which shows uh, the nodes are either variables or operations. So in this case, it's an operation here. These are variables. This is referred to as a computational graph. And that is a very simple arithmetic. So this could be a kind of computational graph where we have uh, tensor 1, tensor 2, we have matrix multiplication, and we have an output. By the way, the tensors, uh, scalars are referred to as tensor of order 0. Vectors are uh, tensors of order 1. And uh, uh, matrices are tensors of order 2, and so on. So you have, uh, you have these various uh, things that could be matrix multiple. This is the computational graph. Nice thing about um, uh, TensorFlow and these kinds of software libraries, they allow you to visualize the network and they actually, they, if you go to their website, they will show you how the data flows. It's kind of a nice thing to observe how your data is flowing through. Uh, and uh, they have this thing called TensorBoard visualization, which provides some really nice looking pictures ready-made pictures you can generate for your uh, for your networks you're implementing. Let's look at this one at big. It says input and then more something called reshape. This is a ReLU layer. That's the kind of um, thresholding function. It could have been sigmoid or it could have been TANH or uh, ReLU is the, is the thing that is being used uh, nowadays in these uh, networks. Uh, logic layer, softmax, it's a standard multi-class output. You have cat, dog, and uh, and whatever person, that kind of thing, the ship, ship it was. So that's uh, referred to as a multi-class output instead of two class. Logistic regression will do only two class. Multi-class, so you'll have to use a soft max version of it. And that box, this is about gradients and uh, that's about the SGD trainer, a stochastic gradient trainer. These are all the ingredients that come into play. All right, wow. So <laughs> we've got all the, we got an idea of tensors, we got an idea of flow, and we got an idea of computational graph specification. And why do we need this computational graph is to visualize your network. It's something to help debug uh, your, your, your code, so computational graphs, or you write a paper saying, here is my network, creates some nice drawings for it. All right, so we're going to write this code in TensorFlow. This buzz in TensorFlow. So you got to do in uh, these are uh, uh, Python-like statements. Import these uh, libraries. Import NumPy as NP. Import TensorFlow as TF. So those kinds of abbreviations are going to be used. And the input to network input I represented as a bit vector. We said that already. So this is uh, the input I. This is the set of inputs here, and that's going to be represented as a bit vector. Distributed representation is key to deep learning. So this is the standard stuff where things are all spread out and together they provide a, an answer to it. The parameters are not just one or two parameters. It's going to be a whole slew of parameters. So we turn each input into a vector of activation going to the next stage. And uh, we, have a, we define a binary encoder for the input i. So this code is take uh, uh, i, the input i, and how many bits you want. We, we just said number of digits. D is the number of input bits, that's 10 we said. So it's going to return an array over here, a little bit of Python syntax over here. And uh, so, so this is here the Python syntax here. That is I uh, greater than greater than D returns I shifted to right by D places. Uh, and uh, there is a, an ampersand comes in here, bitwise logical and operator. So what we are doing here is uh, these uh, numbers are, are being represented bitwise over here uh, using certain number of bits here. So that's the logic to convert the uh, integer into a bit representation. 
the output for training. So we're going to do supervised learning. So when we have these inputs, so you got to know what is what should be the correct output. This should be the number passed along, or it should be a fizz or a buzzer, a fizz buzz. So for that reason, we would want to have a fizz buzz encoder, not not for the purpose of uh, of implementing the machine learning program, but to, to generate the data to be able to match the input against the output. So this code here, this is a modulo, right? This is a modulo. The remainder is equal to zero. Return return this. So this is the uh, one hot vector here. Only one bit is on. Right, zero 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 one zero zero one zero zero one zero zero and one. So that's the one hot vector, and uh, and uh, and this is what we should be returning. So that's how we're going to generate the data set to be input. And as, as we said, our data set is not going to be uh, uh, you know zero through hundred or one through hundred. It's going to be hundred and one through thousand twenty four will be the training set. So this will provide that uh, encoding when we run it through I through ten twenty four. So again, uh, generating the training samples, no cheating. Can't use uh, one through hundred in training data because that's what we're going to be testing it on. How good your program is. So we train on all remaining numbers up to ten twenty-four. Define this is a little bit of, uh, of TensorFlow syntax. Define TRX using binary and code one hundred one to ten twenty-four. Define TRY. This is training X, training Y using FISBuzz encode. So we know the code for generating the training data. And that is all being said over here once again. Uh, and we got to know a little bit of uh, Python syntax over here. And it's a range three, zero, one, two, and so on. So it looks a little complicated, but right? I read somewhere in people uh, uh, the people of Bangalore speak C plus plus, right? <laughs> I saw this I'm right up about Bangalore. So now we're all going to be people of IOC are going to be speaking Python. So anyway, so this is this becomes uh, this becomes. That article said people you know, to go to Bangalore. You got to know C plus plus, and then you got to know Beta, Saco, or something like that. This is it, right? Okay, number of hidden units. Okay, could be ten. So we probably be saying our number of hidden units is one uh, hundred. Did I say thousand on that? Okay, I think that was wrong. We're going to use hundred here. Maybe thousand was too much for this problem. Hundred. Input and output variables. So we we'll need an input variable of width num digits, output variable with width. Now comes some critical thing in in TensorFlow. You have things called TF dot placeholder. X is TF dot placeholder. Y is TF dot. X is the input. Y is the output. What is a placeholder? A placeholder is a variable that we will assign data to at a later date. It allows us to create our operations and build our computational graph without needing the data. And again, a computational graph is operations and inputs are nodes, and values used in operations are directed edges. That's the graph I showed earlier. So we can create networks by using this idea called placeholders in TensorFlow. Okay, so you want to in machine learning we do all these things like we start with randomly initialized weights, right? In these networks. We start with some random initialization of the weights, and then we observe for any training input what is the output, and then we ask the question: Was that good or was that not good? And then we we go back and and we we correct the weights. Of course, we don't do it one at a time. Typically, we do it at a batch at a time, called a mini batch. Or uh, it's actually defined in terms of your entire data set. You input the training set. And then you look at the output, and you do it for all the members of the input set, and you take all of it, and you compute something like the sum of squared errors, right? And then we want to minimize the sum of squared errors, for which we take the derivative of the sum of squared errors function, and we set it equal to zero, and uh, we solve for all the weights that provided this output. So that is the standard um, gradient descent uh, optimization that goes on in the neural network. If it is done one at a time or a mini batch at a time, it is uh, referred to as stochastic gradient descent. Present ten samples at a time and uh, and, re and redo all the weights. They provide another ten, right? So, what should be the mini batch size? What's your favorite mini batch size? Hmm? One number. Give me a number. One or is it? 128. Yeah, this program actually uses 128. But uh, my friend Yan Lekun, <laughs> he leads the Facebook uh, machine learning group. Uh, 
He says, uh, friends do not allow friends to have mini batch size more than 32. <laughs> he says, keep it small. Keep it small. Don't make it very large, even you have the computing power. Stochastic gradient descent is, uh, the reason it's called stochastic is, it's kind of randomly fluctuates, right? And, uh, and, and so you have to have some, some size of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the number of inputs, okay, anyway. So random, so we have the initial weights, one hidden layer and one output layer, and then you have defined weights, and then you, uh, it provides you conveniently things like TF dot random, normal, shape, standard deviation, what kind of randomness do you want in these weights? You can control that part of it. All right. So this is the uh, weights. H is always hidden. O is output. Right. So these are the weights. Initialize the weights here, and so on. So this kind of stuff is already available to you in the library. And then goes on about defining the model. Define the model using one hidden layer and relu activation. All right, those who are not familiar with uh, the rectified linear unit, it looks like that. For a long time in neural networks, we've been using the sigmoid uh, output, right? You, you, you take all the sum of all the inputs coming into a neuron, weighted sum of all the inputs, you add them up, uh, and then uh, you, you, you uh, run it through uh, an activation function here, and it becomes zero or one, it fires or doesn't fire. That's the kind of thing we've been doing. But uh, deep learning kind of changed things, saying we're going to use the ReLU, which looks like this. Um, uh, for all negative values of input, it's going to be uh, zero, and then it uh, goes on a 45 degree line after that. And why do we use ReLU? ReLU activation is defined like this. G of Z is equal to max zero comma Z. That's the ReLU, rectified linear unit. Why do we use ReLU? Uh, easy to optimize your similarity with linear units. Only difference is the output zero across half its domain. Derivative is one everywhere. The reason we use uh, sigmoid that are so popular is uh, the derivative of the sigmoid has a very simple form to it. And the derivative is the key to everything here in machine learning because we're going to be uh, computing a loss function. And then we, take, we have to take the derivative to be able to change all the weights. And then of course the famous algorithm called back propagation uh, allows you to compute in an efficient way uh, the derivatives, right? So derivative is important. It's a, it's a simple form. It turns out derivative is even simpler over here. And so it looks like uh, you're going to be using uh, ReLU. So look at this, a standard definition here, nn.relu. It's available in TensorFlow. So of course, this slide is about minimizing the cost function. So it's essential for all machine learning, deep learning, uh, all uh, neural network style programs to be able to uh, define your cost function. And uh, a popular one is called uh, cross entropy, cross entropy error function. Here is the cross entropy error function. Error of W, that W is, bold W is a set of all weights in the network, all the weights for the connections. And uh, uh, this is of the form T L logarithm of Y. T is the target output, what should have been the output, and Y is what the model is outputting. Uh, that Y is defined here in this way, softmax style function. So when you have multiple outputs, you use, this is called softmax function here, right? And uh, gradient descent turns out to have a simple form that uh, the derivative here has a simple form YK minus TK. Take the difference between what you're getting output and what should have been output, take the difference between the two. It's a very simple formulation. And in this gradient descent approach, of course, we start somewhere. This is the EW function, where a function plotted against all the, the, uh, the uh, coordinates here are all the values of the weights. And this is the E function on top of it. And we might have started with a random point somewhere over here because you, you chose some random point. The goal is to try to proceed and, and find a minimum. All right. The optimization folks would say, look, you know, this is uh, non-convex optimization and, uh, and any of these kinds of simple gradient descent is going to end you up in a, in a local minimum and uh, uh, can you live with that? <laughs> Turns out in all of this deep learning, that's where the alchemy of, <laughs> alchemy <laughs> of neural networks uh, or deep learning comes in. Well, it turns out the stochastic gradient descent and uh, 
grade, uh, stochastic gradient descent we are talking about, not something much more fancy than that. They seem to be doing pretty well, right? Which kind of brings up this issue of uh, is deep learning alchemy, alchemy. That is, uh, you really don't understand everything here, do you? You know, <laughs> and you try this and say it works pretty, pretty well. So there are all kinds of interesting challenges. Uh, one of which is uh, uh, why does uh, non-convex optimization using simple gradient descent? Why, you know, why does it mostly work well? The other thing also to mention is the so-called idea of capacity of a neural network. Capacity is. A, how much can it represent? How much knowledge can it represent in it? If you give it a huge number of hidden units, a large number of layers, the capacity increases tremendously. Uh, and uh, uh, it says, even though you, you increase the capacity, the generalization is still good. The problem with capacity is, if you have a high capacity uh, device, it can memorize everything you're giving it in the training set. Right, directly memorize simply the CFAR training. That's what we said. CFAR training set. Uh, some of these neural networks people use have enough memory to memorize the entire CFAR data set. Uh, but they say, look, it still generalizes well. That's the key to it. In the sense, if you provide inputs that it has not seen before, does it do well on that? If you give high capacity, it's called as uh, overfitting. Right, so we don't like overfitting because it does not generalize. That's the key to machine learning: uh, is uh, not memorizing. But Google, hmm. Google actually is more like a table lookup only. Is what? Table lookup. Table lookup. Table lookup. Mm -hmm. So it's memorizing. Actually. Memorizing the whole thing. Yeah. But high capacity. Yeah. Google search is uh, high capacity. I thought of that. Yeah, I thought it was the case. <laughs> they memorize the whole world wide web and just throws out exactly what you want. No machine learning needed, right? But generalization is the key to it. When you compress it, lossy compression is key to machine learning. Lossless is useless, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, it's good for your uh, zip files. Your zip file should be lossless but not for machine learning, you should compress it, which means learn what is essential. You only have so much memory in your head to understand all of this, and which means compress it well, so that you can use that knowledge. All right, so this is gradient descent. How do we do gradient descent in, uh, in, uh, in TensorFlow? Uh, we have this TF reduced mean, soft max, cross entropy. If you look at this, it knows what is cross entropy. So cross entropy, uh, you don't have to define what is the definition. This is cross entropy function over here, all right? Cross entropy. Look at that function. It's called cross entropy. It looks like the, uh, the standard famous Shannon's entropy, which is uh, summation pi log pi is Shannon's entropy. Here we have two distributions coming over here. The cross entropy between them, uh, the t's and the and the log y's. You know, that's why it's called cross entropy. Okay, prediction. Prediction is the output. Prediction will be just the largest output. Uh, in the sense, I presented the picture of the cat, and uh, what is what do your network says? It says the largest one hopefully is cat, and not dog or ship. And uh, but this will be an output from uh, zero to three. We said this is one hot encoding. It's going to give you an answer uh, zero to three. For fizz, it will say one. And buzz it will say two, and fizz buzz it will say three. So, we, but we want a fizz buzz output. So we say define fizz buzz uh, string i fizz buzz fizz buzz and prediction. Okay, so there's some some syntax over here. Again, string i is outputting whatever was i. This is the first one. Those are the four values. So, how do we train this thing? So training, we're ready to train the model, grab a so-called TensorFlow session and initialize the variables called TF session as SES and initialize the variables. So now comes what's called as training epochs. Great word, epoch. <laughs> epoch, right? Epoch is what? We have Indian words for it, right? It's like how many? How many millions of years is uh, one epoch? <laughs> Same kind of thing. We have big numbers over here. And training epochs, 10,000 epochs of training. So we shuffle them for each iteration. We present this data again and again and again to this network. That's how this, this learns by repeated presentation. For the epoch in range uh, 10,000, 
So you have uh, this uh, stage of uh, the training is going on here, and, uh, and then we have TRX, TRY, and so on. Each epoch in, okay, this is the one. Yan Lukun would say, friends don't allow many batch sizes more than 32. 128 seems to be the standard one that seems to be picked up all over. But uh, they're saying try out, there's all kinds of experiments you can do. So this again comes into alchemy. Do you understand what should be the mini batch size? Right, so uh, so these are these are things that that okay. Anyway, batch size equal to one twenty eight. Each training pass, each epoch training batch size one twenty eight. Batch size equal to one twenty eight. Each training pass looks like start range batch size. Okay, session run train. All right. So anyway, the syntax looks a little bit complicated, but you are all going to be Python experts. Okay, accuracy on the training. Okay, one more thing is, in machine learning and pattern recognition, we drill into saying never test on the training set, right? That's cheating. But, it, you know, these programs actually allow you to do uh, what is the performance on your training set, which is not what you're going to be advertising afterwards in your paper. And this is the helpful to see how, but it would be helpful to see how training accuracy evolves. So you want to see what is the performance on your training set as you are moving along? And the testing, once a model is trained, it is FISBUS time. Okay, we're going to take this machine learning program. Input is binary encoding of numbers 1 through 100. It has never been shown the numbers 1 through 100. It only knows 101 to 1024. And the output uh, is a FISBUS function applied to model output. Model output is uh, the one hot vector, and we apply the FISBUS function to that. By the way, this my set of slides I'll be putting up on my on my sites. So if you want to look at this uh, more closely, you can do that later. My last lecture slides are already up there. Okay, so my last Monday's lecture. So this way, this I'll put up. I was doing some fine tuning, so I'll put it up later. So performance like I said, how did this program do? So this is the output. It says one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, eleven, fizz, thirteen, fourteen, fizz, buzz. Did all of that. But if you look at it closely, I don't know, I found somewhere, one of them is wrong. Hey, you're pretty good at it, which one is it? 29 and 29. Yeah, huh? Yeah, and it's wrong, you know? This is wrong. This is, this is, uh, this is good. This is good. Right? So it's not, I didn't learn it exactly. Uh, running code on GitHub got some outputs wrong. 0.9 fizz accuracy, 0.99 buzz accuracy. So it's clearly harder to teach fizzing than buzzing. <laughs> yeah, divide by three, that's hard. Divide by five, yeah, it's either, either ends in a zero or a five, that's easy, right? So, okay, we have uh, written a machine learning program in the latest state of the art framework from Google called TensorFlow and on what? On FISBUS. On FISBUS. Yeah, it's not there, huh? I don't know. So, I have three students from uh, Ramaya College who are second year engineering students coming to my office tomorrow. Maybe they're here. Are you here, Ananya? You're here. Your first project is to implement FISBUS on TensorFlow. All right, and get started by tomorrow. All right, so next week you would have learned all the TensorFlow and implemented FISBUS. And we will answer this question, which is what is the accuracy on FISBUS? Huh? 100% right? Okay. All right, so then you are in business. You can write any deep learning program after that. But you won't have this uh, GPU available to you. You can use the free time on Amazon or something. Try that. Or just run it on your laptop. Hmm? There's another hardware, which is called a Fovigay stick. It is almost as uh, large as a human hand. Yeah. And, uh, it can be turned into a super guy. Yeah. And, uh, How much does it cost? $70. $70? Dollars. Yeah. Well, that's too much for Ananya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My students come and say, Professor, I spent $200 and bought this thing for my laptop. I said, oh, I felt badly about it, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Okay. How are we doing on time? I was given. Uh, 
Yeah, 10.30. Okay, so we have another 20 minutes or so. Okay. So, let's, so that was about fizz buzz. Okay, so you, you know where to go and look. Not that I taught you everything here. At least uh, you could get started by, by studying it on, on your own now. So, practical methodology. Okay, so what are some of the practical things that we need to know to be a deep learning uh, programmer? And other than knowing TensorFlow and all that, performance metrics using baseline models, uh, whether you need to gather more data, uh, selecting hyperparameters, debugging strategies, these are all practical issues in, uh, in getting into AI and deep learning. So one can spend a lot of time discussing all of these. Let's see, I'll summarize it here, metrics for regression. So there are, um, if the task is regression, right, regression is a task of uh, drawing a curve, uh, like when you, drew, when you were in uh, elementary school or middle school, you were doing some simple experiments, you had values of x and your values of y and you, you fit a curve through it. It can't be a smooth curve, it shouldn't be too uh, undulating going through all the day. That problem is called regression. So input, output, what is the hint? So that's regression. And uh, how could you uh, evaluate how good your method is? Uh, you could use squared errors, some are squared errors. If you have a set of inputs in your testing set uh, and you know what the output should have been and you could calculate uh, the differences between those and you square them all, add them up, there would be some squared errors. You want to minimize that quantity. Uh, quite often we want uh, um, density estimation to be performed. These are called generative models. So you got your data and you got to model this data as a probability distribution. You want to accurately model it because you're going to be using that model to generate samples. So lots of examples. I think I showed some last time. Maybe I'll show some more in the future lectures about generating all kinds of images um, uh, of, uh, of buildings and so on. You learn the distribution, what it looks like. So those are called uh, generative models. And uh, how do you um, uh, determine whether a, a, a probability distribution learned by the model is good? Uh, this is a concept that's extremely important in machine learning, which is called KL divergence. So you have, uh, if you have a distribution, let's say we're testing our system and we we, uh, we knew all the data, we knew the distribution, and you learned some distribution and you want to ask, how good is it? So you do, do the kullback leibler divergence between the two, that becomes a measure of how good the, uh, how good the learning of that is, density estimation. This thing about generating images reminded me, um, you know, this whole area of deep learning, some people say, what is deep learning? It's a lot of math, it's a lot of data. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that is deep learning. Uh, the kind of math, it can be quite complicated here, tensors and all these things. And I was just looking at the N media site. You said, this is for the future I mean, this is a graphics processing unit. You can generate beautiful images and so on. And it's also for all this math we do in, in, in deep learning. They said, this, this processor, you know, NVIDIA, whatever, is a processor for the Leonardo da Vinci's and the Einstein's, <laughs> right? So you can imagine yourself that you are, you are generating all kinds of art and, uh, you know, language and whatnot, you know, which is beautiful. And then and the math you're doing is tensors and all kinds of complicated mathematics. So that's the beauty of working in this area. You, you can be a, an artist and a scientist. And some of the math that comes into machine learning, deep learning is really fascinating stuff, which is a lot of it derived from physics. It really derived from Einstein and Bose and all, whatever they did with, uh, with molecules and things like that, the statistical concepts. But exactly what we're using. We still use the same names. Like we still call it Z is the partition function to uh, represent the probability distribution. And uh, partition function, where did that come from? That's because in physics they call it partition function. And Z is a German word that's Z is from something, you know. It's a idea of a partition function. It's a summation of overall possible values, right? Uh, of a particular function which normalizes your distribution. So anyway, k divergence. So that concept is a little subtle, but uh, it's very useful. Metrics for classification. If it was just cats and dogs and ships, 
one measure is accuracy in terms of how often did it get it right, right? Cats and dogs, you divide how many did you try out and how many was it right? And so, the first buzz we were looking at is accuracy. And uh, metrics for unbalanced data. This is something that's, that's a really peculiar problem. Is if you have your data set, let's cats and dogs. If you have like you know 900 cat images and uh, 100 dog images, it's a very unbalanced data set. And uh, if the program simply always outputs cat, 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 never outputs dog, you have a 90% accuracy system. Kind of ridiculous. So because of the unbalanced data set you have. So how do you balance it? Well, you could balance it by throwing away 800 cat images and saying 100 and 100. So now you can try this out. But it doesn't sound right. Kind of all of these images you can learn about cats and you, you throw it all away. Randomly you pick, pick some set. So isn't there a better way of uh, balancing the data? And there are methods of balancing the data uh, where you can, you can uh, one simple idea of balancing data is, um, is sort of a discriminative model, like I what I described, a cat or a dog. I could use a generative model. So I take the 900 cat examples and generate a probability distribution of cats here. It's only about cats, it nothing knows nothing about dogs. And then I take the 100 samples I have here, I generate a distribution for dogs. So I've separately learned these two distributions. Now I can use the two generative models together to define the discrimination. As you probably know from your pattern recognition course, that one can um, uh, develop a classifier either as a discriminative model or as a generative model. Discriminative model is directly solving the problem. Dog versus cat is the problem. Usually efficient and uh, people always opt for that. It's so many so fewer parameters if you're using a discriminative model, like logistic regression and the discriminative model. Generative model says, forget about the uh, final problem, just learn these distributions. It seems like an inefficient way of doing it, but it solves the unbalanced data problem. So once you know the class conditional distributions, you can generate the posterior distributions of the classes by simple application of Bayes rule uh, because you have learned the class conditionals separately. Uh, anyway, these are the kinds of things you go, you know. So anyway, there are other ways of handling it, loss, using specificity, sensitivity, and so on. And uh, if your task is the Google task of, uh, of retrieval, precision and recall is a standard way. Uh, and then combining precision recall is called F measure, a single number saying how good it is. So you get some number F measure. And uh, you, you encounter other things too. You would like to do image segmentation. Like on Facebook, they will segment out a face and things like that. How do you measure that? How good is it? If it gives you somebody's half face, right? Uh, is that good? It just it cut off the face in the middle and give you another part. Well, it got some of it right and some of it is wrong. So there are uh, measures, something called dice coefficient is a measure. So anyway, there's, depends on the task. There's so many measures of uh, performance metrics you would have to use. Now, how do we use this? This could be the final output. The FISBUS used uh, uh, used uh, um, cross entropy method of determining the uh, because it's a binary output. When you when when your outputs are binary, cross entropy is popular. If you kind of regression problem, you do sum of squared errors. Sum of squared errors is a good measure for uh, continuous outputs. Uh, it can be shown that it's what's called as the maximum likelihood solution to the problem is equivalent to sum of squared errors. Cross entropy if you have discrete binary outputs and so on. So these are standard ones, but then you are evaluating FISBUS in terms of accuracy. So there's a little bit of disconnect over there. But anyway, these are all the performance metrics. Now there are so many choices to be made. Those of you have implemented, I think many of you have implemented in deep learning uh, programs. And uh, there are so many choices. Uh, so the main algorithms you'd like to choose if you're gonna build a system is what kind of optimization algorithm you're going to use because it's all about optimizing the parameters of the network and the other part is what kind of regularization you're going to use 
I didn't mention regularization at all in my code. That's something that comes into play. I think I have a slide on that after this. So choice of optimization algorithm. Stochastic gradient descent that is going about finding whatever minimum you can find. And there are so many variations there, linear decay, exponential decay. You have this uh, decay in the sense, you know, wt plus 1 is equal to wt minus epsilon uh, derivative of the error function. That's a standard gradient descent equation. And uh, you can have uh, uh, methods here of varying this between linear decay, exponential decay, decreasing the learning rate by a factor of 2 to 10, then validation error rate plateaus. Okay, there is another part that the program didn't talk about is uh, uh, using a validation set as opposed to simply using the training set and learning on that. So you want to uh, test your performance on some other set uh, every time you update and uh, decide to stop, early stopping. If you keep on improving, improving, improving until it gets perfect, not going to be good because it's overfitting. And then you're going to go back and say, no, no, unlearn some of it. Keep it, keep it general. All right. So anyway, Adam, this is one. My, my students come and say, well, I use Adam Optimizer. All right, where do you get that? Okay, that's a library function available. It's called some adaptive something. It's called a, It's not a named after Adam and Eve. It's named after. Uh, it's named after uh, some adaptive method. Batch normalization can have a dramatic effect on optimization performance. Uh, reasonable to omit batch normalization from very first baseline unless optimization is problematic. All right, there are all these fine things that uh, one has to learn. Regularization. Um, I did mention regularization last time. It's a very important topic that in machine learning, the goal is not optimization. The goal is generalization. So in optimization, we would have to find the best possible function to fit this data. Here we say, no, that's not the problem of machine learning. We would like to fit the, not only fit the data, but we'd like to generalize to data you've not seen before. Seems like a very strange statement. Say, so how could I possibly learn about things I've never seen? Right. And that is where regularization comes into play. There are something like 20 different methods of regularization at your disposal when you become a deep learning programmer. Um, unless training set includes tens of millions of examples, should include some sort of some sort of form of regularization from start. Early stopping should be used universally. That is, uh, you should you should stop uh, when your uh, validation set performance starts going up. It means that at that point you are kind of beginning to overfit. Uh, that's early stopping. Don't keep continuing to run through those epochs. All right. And then uh, there are so many others. One favorite one nowadays is dropout. Uh, where we're essentially saying if you've got a neural network coming in, drop out some of these links here. Don't use all the links. Make it noisy. Um, and uh, it's not just that physical thing. We're looking at a nice, interesting theory uh, in this whole dropout. So you've got early stopping. And one standard one, which comes from standard statistics, even for uh, linear regression, is uh, using um, the norm penalties. So you are not just minimizing the sum of squared errors. You add a term to it which is the length of the vector you're going to learn, because you're going to be learning a w, which is a vector. Don't make that w uh, um, you know, a very large set of values. Like e each element of the vector shouldn't be like you know, 100 million, 73 million. Those are all huge numbers. You want to keep the length of that vector short. All right? So norm penalty. If it becomes too big, then, it, then it's not good. So you want to add that norm penalty. It could be Euclidean norm, what the norm. So that's a standard way of regularization is the norm penalty. And then you're early stopping, you have drop out, and so many things. Tangent vector is another idea that, that people use. Uh, another powerful one is, uh, is data augmentation. Okay, I've got only this many cat pictures here. What do I do? Well, okay, create more cat, cat pictures on your own. <laughs> so you run through these images and create more images. They're like adding noise to it or distorting them, so on, make a whole bunch of images. Uh, this is called data augmentation. Turns out data augmentation works very well. You know. 
it knows all these distortions now, it's learning all about these things and, and it does a pretty, pretty good job. So there are something like 20 different things that you could use. So that's where the alchemy comes comes in again, saying where is the science behind all of this. Okay, more data to improve performance. After end-to-end -end system established, it is time to measure performance and determine how to improve it. All right, FizzBuzz said 90%, 99%. Instead of other learning algorithms, it is often better to get more data than improve learning algorithms. Huh. Says, okay, so um, should we abandon this algorithm? Should we uh, come up with, okay, let's use SVM for this or something. Uh, or this is saying that uh, more data might be the key to the problem. Again, an area of uh, some better understanding needed. Uh, determining whether more data needed. De determine performance on training data. If performance on training data is poor, algorithm is not using data. Uh, that's where the training data comes in. Why should you be checking the performance on training data rather than a validation data or testing data? If the performance is poor, maybe your data is not being used properly by your algorithm. So more data is not needed. Instead of try increasing model size, capacity, how many units, how many layers? More layers, more hidden units and layers. And try improving performance. Is this from my mic? Oh, right under the fan, yeah. Okay. You say try uh, increasing model size. More layers, uh, more in your okay, fine. Try improving learning algorithm. Example, tune, uh, tuning the learning rate hyperparameter. Learning rate is uh, uh, that. Um, uh, you're going to be multiplying the derivative by that epsilon or eta, and that is the learning rate, tuning that. If performance unsatisfactory, quality of training data may be responsible, too noisy, not include the right inputs, suggesting starting over with new data. Anyway, these are all practical things people have been putting out. Hyperparameter is a, is a big issue in machine learning. There are a whole bunch of hyperparameters goes in that a programmer throws in. We've always been saying machine learning is all about getting rid of the programmer. It's just giving the input output data and learning. So, but still you're putting in something the programmer puts in, the learning rate epsilon. And then we have, okay, let's say that's a learning rate epsilon is uh, what we're multiplying the derivative by. But we also have another one which is the regularizing coefficient. So the what we're trying to minimize, sum of square errors plus lambda times the length of the vector. What is lambda? It says how important is uh, this factor about uh, minimizing the norm penalty? If you have got lambda equal to zero, there is no penalty. Lambda is very high, the penalty is extremely important. So that's a hyperparameter that goes in. Of course, so what do we do with choosing hyperparameters? Choosing them manually requires of understanding of what they do. And uh, knowledge of how they achieve good generalization, right? So this gets some experience in machine learning. Choosing them automatically, okay, that's another approach. Instead of choosing them manually, you could choose them automatically. Reduce the need to understand these ideas, but computationally expensive. So we're trying our well, try out all possible values of lambda, all possible values of epsilon. <laughs> it would be a tremendous amount of resources spent on that, saying which is the ideal. Okay, so we are in this world of complicated networks that are learning, and uh, students find it quite frustrating. They don't know where the problem is. It's not working well. Uh, when system performs poorly, difficult to tell, Poor performance is intrinsic, intrinsic to algorithm itself. So you chose, uh, you know, you, what is it that you chose? What is the network you chose? You use convolutional neural networks. And um, so is it because of the algorithm is, is something is wrong with it? Or is there an implementation bug? You didn't implement it right. And uh, cannot tell a priori the behavior of the algorithm, what, how this is going to perform. But the entire point of machine learning is it will discover useful behavior we are not able to specify ourselves. So this is the point of machine learning is uh, it has to discover representations 
and we are not telling it how what it should discover. And amazingly, they, I, mean, I think I gave some simple examples last time, and my next lecture is going to be on representations. Is uh, we were looking at handwriting data, and it figured out that the height, the shape, some things like that, which we never input, and it's saying that is those are the important features. And that is the thing about disentanglement of the features automatically. So this is useful behavior that we are not able to specify ourselves. And if classification test error rate is 5%, we cannot tell whether this is expected behavior or suboptimal behavior. These are, these are issues that we encounter here, difficulty with debugging. Let me see if I have a solution to that. Hmm. Multiple adaptation levels. So difficulty is that machine learning models have multiple parts that are each adaptive. So you, in these networks, you might have uh, the, a standard uh, network looks like this. It's not just one hidden layer. You're going to have today uh, the cat dog solution. You're going to have the input, and there's a convolutional layer and the pooling layer, right? And then there's a convolutional layer and a pooling layer. And uh, so what's happening is it's discovering features. Uh, let's say I just, and then groups that are just together at the next level, the next level, so on. So network looks like that. Convolutional pooling, convolutional pooling. Typically the last layer is going to be a fully connected, they call it FCN, fully connected network. So we come to the last layer, which is a simple, layer which does simple classif linear classification. And there's another uh, thing that comes in. What you're doing with dogs and cats and ships and your last layer is a linear classifier, which means there's simple straight lines separating the classes. And the function of all of this deep learning is to disentangle the variables they're all independent variables, it's figuring it out. It brings it to a point where you can use a simple classifier. A simple classifier, like a linear classifier, cannot do a simple thing like computing exclusive or. If you draw on a, on a square uh, value 0, 1 along the x-axis, 0, 1 along the y-axis, you plot exclusive or, it will be two points along one diagonal, two points along the other diagonal. Uh, so your four points, let's say, these are binary variables, 0, 1, 0, 1. And uh, you cannot separate uh, these uh, dots from the x's when it's 1 and when it is 0 by a simple straight line. So you're saying in this world, uh, you're going to have a last layer, a simple linear thing that cannot even do exclusive or? Yeah, the last layer is going to be a linear classifier. All the work that has been done is in the earlier layers disentangling the variables and bringing to a representation where a fully connected simple uh, linear classifier will do. That's all we use in the last stage. So all the work is being done in the feature extractors up to that point. Okay. All right. And so it is saying there are going to be all these layers. If one layer is somehow something went wrong, the other layer is trying to adapt to that. If one part is broken or other parts can adapt and get acceptable performance. So you're going to have this scenario with a network also. All right, so uh, debugging strategies. I need to get around two difficulties. Whether performance is intrinsically poor or has a bug. Whether parts are compensating for each other. It's not a little bit like a human body also, right? If we also compensate if something is is wrong with us in some part, you know, we, we try and compensate for it. That's the beauty of all of this deep learning. We constantly encounter biological type of behavior. Uh, fit a tiny data set, compare back propagated derivatives to numerical derivatives. So this is another thing that comes in. A lot of deep learning type of thing involves numerical computation. That's another danger you have to be aware of. Of course, all these libraries will do all that for you. You don't have to really know uh, how to uh, deal with uh, derivatives and uh, the flow, the uh, underflow, overflow. We're talking about probabilities and derivatives, so on. But still, it is worthwhile to know the numerical part. So one of the lectures I give on deep learning is about numerical computation, 
But for a lot of students, that's not interesting. That's like looking under the hood of a car. I just want to drive the car, you know. I don't need to know how this internal combustion engine works, right? So, um, but good to know that if you're in the wilderness or something, <laughs> you have to open the hood and fix it yourself. So, uh, here is what is numerical derivative? So, you, you got to know how do you compute the derivative of a function numerically and you can implement that part and compare it against what has been provided by the library functions. Monitor histograms of activations and gradient. So, a TensorFlow program can be quite short. Most of the programs are fairly short, but the debugging and all these things can, can take a lot of time and effort. Okay, I guess I come to the end here. So, this is my uh, introduction to a machine learning class. Um, my lecture today was geared to the students. So, uh, I run through, I think, three projects for this class. Uh, and uh, nowadays, I'm bringing in deep learning right into the introductory course. Why simply say you're not going to learn, uh, you know, because there are out there looking at all these implementation available. I want to do that right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm trying to introduce that. Right. But I do the first couple of projects. First project I give is linear regression. Second project I give is logistic regression and neural networks, simple neural networks. And the third one is now deep networks. That's what we're doing. So all this material is kind of coming up front. Hundreds of students want to learn all of this stuff now. And I think we might as well teach them deep learning right at the beginning. But the issues here are you got to, the math comes in now. Tensors and all the linear algebra, probability theory, all of that hits you right away. But uh, what a nice motivator for students to want to learn that stuff now on their own. So otherwise they say, what is this calculus, dy by dx, I hate that. But uh, you know, that's what you have to be doing and, uh, and the probability distributions and all of that. So go in, so implement TensorFlow, you will go learn on your own why you need that stuff, right? Okay, you saw all these pictures, so I'm going to stop there. And uh, okay, please uh, ask any questions if you have. Yeah. Hmm? Pardon me? Oh, you want me to see the previous slide? Okay. Okay. Oh, ah, okay. Actually, even I don't know that well. Um, anyway, these are all things uh, that you could uh, you could uh, look at. Uh, Activations are the outputs provided by the units, you know, and uh, um, and, and and some kind of uh, data analytics you're going to do with it. That's all I can say about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Not sure what, what you're meaning by that question. Uh, uh, normal, you're talking about normalization, right? Uh -huh. hmm. Hmm. Really? Okay. Don't know. I need to learn from you on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding uh, one of the that uh, you mentioned about skewed classification. Ah, unbalanced, unbalanced, yeah. yeah. Uh, we could use suggestion of using generative models. That's my favorite way of dealing with the unbalanced data sets. It, but the thing is that is not, uh, usually discriminative methods are much more efficient. So I, I give this example. What's the difference between a generative model, discriminative model is, uh, you know, some people are speaking here, they're Chinese, let's say, speaking Chinese. 
and you got to say you know which language they are speaking in you know and you don't understand this so of course one could uh, come up with a discriminative model which like just knows knows the sounds of chinese the chinese sounds like this maybe it sounds like sing song to you right that you say do not you any know about chinese but you know the sound of chinese is, is sing song and another person would say no i'm going to go learn chinese that's a lot of work to do a generative model that is uh, oh i know exactly those are chinese words they say they say ni hao ma means how are you that kind of thing so so you end up the generative model is a lot more work to learn the language to be able to say what what it is the other one just knows the sounds of it so discriminative model is like that which takes the shortcut to solve the problem svm is a discriminative model right the other question comes up is a neural network a discriminative model or a generative model and one can argue that it is uh, it can be both of course if it is just a classifier going in this way it's a discriminative model but if you set up like an rbm things like that it is learning a probability distribution it's a kind of another deep network so it's now a generative model it learns the entire probability distribution you can sample it so it is possible to design deep learning networks that are either discriminative or generative but most of the other classifiers can be said which kind it is logistic regression is discriminative uh, svm is discriminative or a simple bayes classifier which learns the probability distribution would be generative model okay yeah is it possible to change the loss function with every new batch change the loss Okay, I didn't understand the question fully. Are you saying with every uh, mini batch, can you change the loss function? Yeah, does it make sense? I don't know. We want to use the same loss function uh, as you as you run through uh, your data set. The only thing being prescribed here is instead of using your entire training data set at time and computing the uh, loss function, you are saying do it in mini batches and bring in that stochasticity, which uh, is of great advantage. Uh, and but you are you are still using the same same loss function right yeah you know in this alchemy thing the answers to some of these questions is you know try it out and you know, that's not a very satisfactory answer there is uh, there are a whole bunch of questions here you know uh, how many hidden layers how many hidden units per layer interesting theoretical question is when you increase the capacity you are able to learn your entire data set and still you are generalizing well how can you prove that why does a network generalize well when its capacity is great so there are a whole slew of questions here of course the some simple answers are how many layers and and there is no single exact answer but it's like a a program should it be this long or should be only this long both do the same thing so there is not a clear cut answer to that and uh, sometimes goes along with our intuition of what it is calculating so there are uh, there are issues like this that uh, that needs to be studied on the on the research side of things you are saying trying out different loss functions all right that could be another ad hoc experiment you could perform have you have you done that Okay, all right, yeah. Okay. We just talked about unbalanced classification problem. Uh huh. So in that case, uh, suppose uh, there are nine hundred cats and hundred dogs. Ah. Oh. So can can this approach work? Like uh, we can augment the data set um, of dogs because it is less, and uh, like bring it up to around nine hundred or thousand, and then use a uh, discriminative model uh, for. yeah that's uh, you know we we one method i mentioned was getting rid of the data on this side <laughs> you're saying no increase the data on the other side so it will depend on i suppose how good your uh, data augmentation method is certain geometrical type of pictures and all that you can easily transform your data right to put apply geometrical transformations um and whereas dogs you know may not be so clear cut and so on so Seems to be. Hmm. Oh really? Yeah. Data augmentation part. Data. You augment the data set on the weak side. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, uh, let me see if I understand the question at all. Use as a generalized, uh, as a, use as a generative model for uh, for data augmentation. Are you kind of referring to GANs here? Yeah, GANs, you know, generative adversarial networks, they use a combination of the generative models and the discriminative models in an adversarial way, right? And they seem to work pretty well. Yeah, maybe maybe that idea is, is along, along what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, there is a question in the back there. Yeah. Yeah, like this mini batch size, right? I said it's 32, not 128. How did you come up with that? Right, this is based on uh, various experiments people have been performing, and I think there are some very good theoretical people entering in this field and, and coming up with you know some theoretical results. For example, the universal approximation theorem it says uh, one hidden layer is enough to compute any function, mathematically proven. Uh, trouble is, uh, you know, the number of hidden units might have to be very large in that one hidden layer, right? So the practical limitations too you have to consider. So um, in each of these uh, questions, there's a room for doing some, some theoretical support on that, you know. So not everything is well understood. And, and the ground is constantly shifting here. You know, people are coming with new models and even uh, Jeff Hinton, who, who invented a lot of this, it's just amazing how few people did all of this stuff. Back propagation, uh, contrastive divergence method for uh, determining the parameters of a generator, like a restricted Boltzmann machine. He did all that. Jan looking came up with, with this uh, convolutional neural networks, things like that. And uh, so there needs to be a, you know, a lot more work to be done on all of this. And it seems like now we have a tremendous uh, range of you know good people working on these things um, that might be coming out. Jeff Hinton is saying now, Oh, all of this stuff was wrong. I've got to start all over again. <laughs> he came up with this paper last September called Capsule Networks, right? Capsule Networks. He says the unit shouldn't be a single unit. It should be a capsule of several units there. So as you move along the network, it should not be a single unit, single unit. It's a capsules, capsules, capsules. So that you can capture more th information as you go along. And so, you know, he threw out this new idea. Of course, whenever Jeff Hinton says anything, and the hundreds of thousands of students jump on it and implement it. And before the paper was published, there were like 100 implementations of capsule net. He put it on archives in September. The paper to be published in December at NIPS or ICLR or something. In that time frame, there were hundreds of implementations. And so the paper presentation becomes what other people have done on my, on my paper. <laughs> I, I already taught it in my class. I taught it in my class before the paper appeared because it was there and people students were asking me about it. Many of the questions you are, you are, you are posing to me are probably, you know, you, you know, you worked on it yourself or the blogs are really nice. There's some of the blogs that students are putting out explaining these things. Like after he, he put it out, 
many students explained uh, how capsule networks, you know, because the paper itself was not so so good in terms of describing everything. Others have gone about expand, expanding on that. This is a, I don't know, they're going at warp speed in terms of how this whole field is developing and answers being developed. That what makes it teaching this exciting for me because what I taught last year is, uh, I feel it's like outdated for this year. I have to start all over again. I have to answer your questions on whatever it is. I have a new uh, way of uh, evaluating the loss function every time. So on. That, that's what makes it exciting. So you are all going to be telling us how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. You've been a good class. I hope some of you will come again uh, next Monday. <laughs> okay. <laughs>